Hello. Welcome to round two. Thanks for coming back from the last one. Thanks for coming for the first time, if it's your first time, and hopefully not your last time. So um, I'm taking a very different track from where Kelly Endo started us off, but it's topical, just like his. Today we're going to talk about the Olympics. So some of us are more excited about the Olympics than others. Um, ladies figure skating ends today, so some of us are very excited about that. But what I want to talk about today is the politics of the Olympics. Now, particularly since Obama did not go to Sochi, and neither did any of the top dogs or really anyone from his administration go, um, what I want to do is take us a little bit backwards about the politics of the Olympics and whether Obama not going to Sochi is as big of a deal as we might think it is, or is it really just kind of commonplace? And so what I have here, just to look at, are some of the examples, with the current one at the bottom, of when the politics, when, excuse me, when the Olympics became political. And it starts very early. And so what we're going to do is look at some examples and then talk about Sochi. So what we'll start off with, and we go all the way back to 1936. And the Olympics were in Berlin. Now, Berlin was chosen as the host city in 1931, which is before Hitler took over. And um, by the time they announce it and then he takes over, now we're about three and a half years into his reign in 1936 when the games go to Berlin. We see here that the torch is being brought into the city. Uh, propaganda, maybe. You decide for yourself if that's what's going on in the background. Um, there was a lot of pressure outside of FDR's administration for us to boycott the Olympics. But inevitably, FDR says, it's not a political decision. We'll let the American Olympic Committee decide. Avery Brundridge, he goes to Berlin. He says, I don't think there's anything really going on here that we need to worry about. I think that we're good. I think we can send our Jewish athletes, our black athletes. I think we're OK. So we go. And Jesse Owens, if anyone knows anything about him, he's the star of the Olympic Games. Um, he's an African-American runner. He takes home four gold medals. And even though we had that success, Germany wins the most medals. So of course, you know, Hitler's very excited about this, right? Showing German pride and showing domination. And so the next Olympic Games are in Tokyo, and Hitler says, okay, we'll, we'll give them, we'll give Tokyo the games, but every other Olympics after this will be in Germany. I think we all see how that turned out by the time we get to 1945. We move along to Tokyo in 1964. Nothing especially interesting necessarily about the fact that it's in Tokyo. But what is interesting is that it's 1964. So we're Cold War ramping, right? We've got this domination, this struggle for domination between the Soviet Union and the United States. And sport is a place in which we can see this happen. So Johnson is quoted before the Olympic Games saying, in this day of international stalemates, nations use the scoreboard of sports as a visible measuring stick to prove their superiority over the soft and decadent democratic way of life. So he's basically calling out the Soviet Union and saying, you think you're so much better than us because we're so soft, and you're going to try to show us this at the Olympic Games. Well, the US does win the most gold medals of any country but the Soviet Union wins the most overall medals. So you can decide from that. We move along a little bit to 1992 in Barcelona. A lot has changed in the world, OK? So the Cold War is over. Eastern Bloc countries, well, the communism falls. Eastern Bloc countries break away. And this is the first Olympic Games in 30 years with no boycotts. So this is a big deal. No country's boycotting. Apartheid is over in South Africa, so South Africa has rejoined and will be competing. The former Soviet countries still compete together as the unified team. And Germany, for the first time, is competing, well, the first time in a while, is competing as one country. So we have a lot that changes before the 1992 games in Barcelona. And George H.W. Bush, the president at the time, and might I add, is running for re-election when he is speaking about this. In 89, the wall came down in Berlin, and this summer, more barriers tumbled there in Barcelona. This was an Olympics. This is why I say it's historic, without boycotts, without terrorism, without politics, and it's just exactly as it ought to be. So while before, presidents took it upon themselves to to sort of rhetorically talk about the politics of the Olympics. 
Bush says, no, 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 it's not about that. It's about the athletes. It's about the sport. And this is exactly what it should be about. Which, again, is a little different, particularly from what Johnson had said in 64. Well, then we got the next Bush, all right? So a couple of interesting things about the 2008 Olympics. So they're in Beijing, and there was a big push for us to boycott the Olympics. Not necessarily the athletes, but to not send any delegation from the government at all to Beijing in 2008 because of the human rights violations going on there. So there's, a, again, a couple of interesting things. Merkel and Gordon Brown and Harper from Canada, they boycott. They don't show up. Now, a couple of other prime ministers and presidents had said they weren't going to show up like Sarkozy, but end up coming anyway. Bush is very quiet about it, but ends up going. Another interesting thing to note is that this is the first time in the history of the Olympic Games that a US president attended an Olympics abroad. And this is, of course, important as we move into talking about Sochi. Now, in 2008, when the Olympics is going on, we're in the midst of a presidential election. And Obama comes out and says, as a candidate running, I would have absolutely boycotted the Beijing Games. I never, ever would have showed up. And actually, McCain, as the other candidate, says the same thing. So we have to wonder, and we'll talk about this in a minute, if Obama saying this in 08 and being on record has anything to do with him not going to Sochi now. OK, we'll get to that in a second. So let's talk about Sochi. <laughs> There was a really funny article posted the day after this that said that the gentleman that was in charge of this went missing in Russia. Um, it was satirical. He's not dead. He's fine, I'm sure, but funny nonetheless. So there has been a lot of talk about why we're not there. We, meaning Obama, anyone in, the, in sort of the, the top of his administration. Now, we have to remember that he did not go to Vancouver. He did not go to London. But he sent his wife and his vice president. For Sochi, there's nobody from the top of his administration that's there. And the delegation that, that has been sent, um, we'll talk about whether there's a message being sent by that delegation. Nonetheless, there has been a lot of discussion about why exactly Obama's not there, and other foreign leaders as well. And so we'll see here. Oh, Vlad. He has a shirt on. Who would have thought? He's wearing a shirt. We are grateful to those who It's the president of the International Olympic, Olympic Committee. sport can only contribute to development and peace Thanks, if it's not used as a stage for political dissent or for trying to score points in internal or external political contests. To other political leaders we say, please understand what our responsibilities are and what your responsibilities are. Have the courage to address your disagreements in a peaceful, direct political dialogue and not on the backs of the athletes. The former president, Jack Roger, and thanks to this heritage, we can People have a very good understanding of what it really means to single out the Olympic Games to make an ostentatious gesture which allegedly costs nothing but produces international headlines. In the extreme, we had to see a few politicians whose contribution to the fight for a good cause consisted of publicly declining invitations they have not even received. So the president of the International Olympic Committee is calling out foreign leaders to say, this is not the place to air your grievances. This is not the place for it. He actually says, have the courage to talk about this publicly. He again is assuming that this is a boycott, a political boycott, a purposeful boycott, right? Now, I can't speak to what other countries are doing, but what I can speak to is maybe how we can assess whether or not that's what's going on here. So is it a political boycott because of Putin's stance on gay rights or not having them, however you want to say it, right? This idea that 
we all know what this means, right? Is that what's going on? So by Obama sending openly gay delegates to the opening and closing ceremonies, is this a message to Putin to say, we don't like what you're doing, I'm not gonna go and be a part of it as the President of the United States, our athletes can go, and the delegates that we send are gonna say something about who we are as a nation and how we feel about how you treat your people. Is that what's going on? Well, apparently the President of the IOC thinks that's what's going on. Is it simply precedent? So the first president to ever attend the Olympic Games ever was Ronald Reagan in 1984 in LA. Ever, right? So it was, a, it was a, an Olympics here in the United States. Okay, makes sense. But we never had a president even go to the Olympics before. And then of course George W. Bush is the first president to go to an Olympics abroad. So it's not commonplace at all for the president to attend an Olympic Games. It is more commonplace to send someone from the top of the administration. So in that instance, Sochi is a little bit different. So is this just precedent? This is Obama saying, I haven't gone to the other two Olympics where I've been president. I'm not going to this one either. Is it because it's Russia? You'll see this picture again when Muck comes up here <laughs> because it's just so precious. Um, is it simply, is it a Putin snub? Is it basically Obama doing this by not going to Sochi? Maybe, right? We're not exactly sure, but we know that there's a couple of things might possibly going on here. The one thing to follow along a little bit with what Dr. Caliendo was saying is that, is it the media? Is this a non-story that is now a story? Because it's something to get us to talk. It's something to get people excited and maybe a little bit cranky, right? Here's what the media has to say. It's a Russian news station, by the way. Some prefer to focus on the United States. And our TV guy, Chicago, looks at where the media criticism of the Olympics is coming from. You know, some media outlets here have tried so hard to make the Olympics in Russia smell like Cold War. In their coverage, some didn't even bother to come up with new tools. New graphics, same old bear. This cover is from 1980 when the U.S. boycotted the summer games in the Soviet Union. Of course, there were calls to boycott the Sochi Olympics as well. Similar images, as you see handcuffs and all barbed wire, not new, as you can see. Andrew Craig, who wrote several books about news coverage in America, is here with me to chat about all this sea of negativity. Thank you so much for coming. Pleasure. Andrew Craig. You know, Russia has come a long way since 1980. It's a very different country now, but it seems all these outlets want their leaders, want their audience to see Russia as if it's still 1980. Well, these are very familiar themes, both to the public, but also to the owners and uh, many of the old-time reporters. So people fall into a comfortable pattern that actually extends back many decades and is quite apparent uh, if you look for it as you've done, and uh, uh, it's quite clear that uh, people took the old magazine covers and said, let's just update it for this Olympics. Stereotypes are strong. Uh, exactly, and uh, you know, they call it the news industry, but in many ways, people like the old industry, but uh, the old themes, but call it news. But sometimes, you know, in the middle of this sea of negativity, sometimes see reports like the one I saw in the New Republic. The author went to a popular gay bar in Sochi and writes about how desperate foreign journalists are trying to find traces of gay persecution there and they can't. Those they talk to say no one is bothering them except journalists. Part of the issue is when people self-censor or they believe they know what the story is before they go to the scene. And what you're describing sounds like a classic case that happens all over the place where uh, reporters think they know what the story is and all they're trying to do is find someone to attach a name and face to the story that's almost written in the reporter or editor's head. 
So what is the actual story, right? Are we trying to recreate the Cold War with same graphics, right? Even the bear, which was a very famous ad that Ronald Reagan ad about, ran about the bear, being afraid of the Soviet bear. They're not even using new graphics. They're trying to ramp up all of these tensions again to make a non-story a story. Is it similarly to when the president of the American Olympic Committee goes over to Berlin in 1935 and says, I don't really think we have anything to worry about. I think that the athletes are going to be OK. Is it similar where the gay athletes or the, the, those that are gay that are living in Sochi are actually, they're, they're OK. They're not being bothered. But it's the media that's saying, oh, we got to be really worried about this. And turning it into a story about a political snub or a boycott when maybe it's a combination of these things, maybe it's none of these things. But what's important to note is that there's always something political about the Olympics, even if it's just an undercurrent or something underlying. But it's important to go back and look and see what exactly is it that's going on. So, thanks so much.